it doesn't matter what you're doing. You could be doing anything to make money. It doesn't have to be real estate related. For me, I chose real estate because it was a high earning type of job that I could do without having to go get a professional degree, like a medical degree. Um, and also because I just like real estate. I just really, I mean, I was a real estate photographer. I like houses. I like buildings. I like architecture. I like business. For me, I actually like it. But some people in this business don't really like real estate. And I feel like do what you like that can make money. And then anything that you make, you invest. You can retire on passive income just from being a passive investor. You don't ever actually have to own your own real estate. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Emma Powell is a stay-at-home mom, a former photographer, and a multifamily syndicator and capital raiser working on financial independence. Emma, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Pleasure's mine. Same three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Uh, well, the stay-at-home mom photographer describes it pretty well. You know, always running like a little cottage business. Got a, got a degree online when I was 40, bachelor's degree in entrepreneurial management. And um, my husband is in the tech industry. He got laid off. So we sold everything in Texas, moved to Salt Lake City in super short notice. And when I got up here, I didn't want to restart my photography business. It was a lot of hustle and grind. And I'm just getting to the point where I wanted to spend less time working, more time with my family, but I still needed something that could make a really good income. And so real estate and business, you, you know, you want to, you want to build wealth, you own a business or you invest in real estate and running a real estate business puts those two things together. And so um, I decided that I wanted to get enough passive income to retire my husband as my new endeavor uh, after we moved. And so I started a real estate business in order to be able to do that. And so I'm mostly retired now. I am still wanting to do deals, obviously, as a passive investor, as a limited partner, but not completely step away from the business uh, just to be able to boost my earnings a little bit from, from what I would be doing as a limited partner. So we started a club recently where we just pool our money and do deals together. So it allows me to be um, still involved in the GP uh, in an advisory or capacity watching over things um, without completely stepping away. And it also gives me a chance to do a little bit less work per deal, as well as bring other people into the deal so they can finally get their first deal done. Or if they're like me and they want to just take a step down for being a, a, an active sponsor. It's a good, it's a good uh, middle ground for a lot of different people. When did you move to Salt Lake City? It was in like the last week of January in 2018. And we got from this beautiful Austin, Texas weather. I think it was 75 degrees the day we drove out. And when we got into Salt Lake, it was like 25 degrees. And I was an angry, angry person for about three weeks. And then we got our first blizzard and I thought, oh, I love it here. So it's been, it's been actually a really good move for us. What, so if I'm understanding this right, stay at home, mom, photographer, you said, Hey, I'm going to step away from this entirely. So from 2018 to now you've done enough deals to basically retire yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I make a lot more money now than I did as a photographer. Like I make more money than my husband, but he is not comfortable quitting his job for two reasons. One, he works hundred percent remote and uh, he can work remote anywhere in the United States. Um, the other thing is he he has a lot of time freedom, even during his job, they have something called flexible time off. And so it's not like PTO where you have to save up days and all that. They just come in and come out as long as their work is done. He can work early in the morning, late at night. He can take lunches off. He can go places with us. And so it's all, it's not a part-time job. He does work full-time, but it, he can schedule it like a part-time person would be able to. So the other thing that he wants is a lot more security in our income stream. Mm -hmm. And so selling a deal or doing a deal, that's active. That's, right. that's my job. And he doesn't want to just have to replace, if he quits, replace his job with my job. He wants it to be completely passive, have a foundation of passive income that comes in at somewhat regular intervals, that W-2 type of security. So monthly or quarterly distributions is what would be making him feel more comfortable. And so between those two things, and you know, also just really liking his company and feeling like they're working on something uh, really important, unusual, and they have a great company culture. So he's like, you know, let's just, let's just wait until we can really feel like we have that kind of a constant income security that you're not having to work for. It is truly passive. And then if we want to work after that happens, that's our choice. It's being financially free, not necessarily retired. 
Right. That's uh, that's really awesome. Did you expect in four years time to be able to step away yourself? Um, I, I don't think I realized that the first six to 12 months, I really thought that it was a way for me to bring in another stream of income that would protect us from another layoff because in the tech industry, it's not if it's when, and um, he was lucky with his first layoff because at the time he was contracting or working for a California company and they had to give him 60 days notice. So that gave him plenty of time to go find a new job. But when that new job was in Texas, when they laid him off, um, it was like, he came home in the middle of the day, 10 30. And he's like, Hey, can we talk? And I mean, every, every wife knows <laughs> with a husband in tech knows what that means. Um, it's just, it's just such a common trope almost. So, um, for me, I just felt like I wanted to protect us from that. My photography was definitely not going to be able to do that. And that was one of the reasons I didn't want to restart the business when we got to Salt Lake. Um, it, but it didn't take very long for me to realize that this income earning potential wasn't just a hedge for unemployment or layoffs. It could not only replace my need to work full-time or even part-time and completely replace his income many times over. And I think that what we've done is the same thing with syndication kind of blows the lid off of what you can earn um, with a W-2 job as we're looking more into fund, fund creation, fund management and capital raising that again, blows the lid off your income potential that you would have even as a, as a syndicator, as an operator. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at next. Um, it is a lot of work. So I'm a little work adverse right now. I'm definitely anxious and ready for retirement. So it's hard for me to plan a lot farther. I know that I'm going to have to take a gap year and take some time off and reevaluate. But thinking about maximizing your income for the time that you're spending is something that you have to do if you claim you want passive income and to spend more time with your family, which everybody does. But then when they say that, the next thing they do is go out and start a syndication business. Right. Guilty. Guilty as charged. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, you don't want to, you know, you know, have, have more time freedom. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the gate. That's not exactly how the, how the no. story goes. No. So I transitioned pretty quickly from active operations to more passive and consulting um, because I just realized that I wasn't being true to my own goals by saying, I want passive income to spend more time with my family and then just build this huge business that takes me away from my family. Yeah. What, how did, how did you, because there's, there's a, there's a, there's a tipping point there, but there's also that like where you, where you have to chase one and not the other at some mm -hmm. point. So how, how did you navigate that? And then, yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. If that question even makes sense. Um, hanging out with people who are doing what you want to be doing and seeing them doing it successfully, um, you have to determine who those people are. And so I came across a couple of people who were basically full-time passive investors, you know, Jeremy Roll, Travis Watts, people in that category, and just watching what they did. I mean, they don't really know who I am, but I know who they are. And they're my, my uh, imaginary mentors, if you will. And so just watching those types of people, there are a few other I talked to who are running syndication businesses or capital raising funds, uh, but they had previously retired on their passive income. And so even though they are working now, they don't have to. And so knowing that about them, I can ask them questions and see how they did it. So just kind of following them around and replicating what they were doing um, helped me figure out really quickly that to retire on passive income, you don't have to be running a real estate business. You can do it from a job. And I, I remember my, my son, when he got his first job, when he was 16 at Sonic and I was driving him to work one day. And I said, you know, if you just work hard, save up your money and start purchasing investments really young, like 16, 18 years old, uh, you could, if you wanted to work at Sonic the rest of your life and be very, very wealthy because you hold a lot of cash flowing assets. And he looked at me and he said, I don't have to work at Sonic the rest of my life, do I? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it doesn't matter what you're doing. You could be doing anything to make money. It doesn't have to be real estate related. For me, I chose real estate because it was a high earning type of job that I could do without having to go get a professional degree, like a medical degree. Um, and also because I just like real estate. I just really, I mean, it was a real estate photographer. I like houses. I like buildings. I like architecture. I like business. For me, I actually like it. But some people in this business don't really like real estate. And I feel like do what you like that can make money. And then anything that you make, you invest. You can retire on passive income just from being a passive investor. You don't ever actually have to own your own real estate. Right. That's a, that's a valid point. It, you know, was there a number that you had to have yes. as a nest egg and you said, Hey, this is my investable assets. 
Yes. Yes. If we go off of the 4% rule, which means that you're drawing down your portfolio at 4% per year of the total mm-hmm. value, um, we needed something a little over 2 million, almost $3 million. Um, if we're going off the 8% rule, which I also see is becoming more commonly accepted because um, your portfolio is going to continue to grow and you're, you're going to be taking out less and less as time goes by. So if you go over the 8%, we were somewhere um, in the million and a half to 2 million range. Um, but if we're going off of the average annual return of 10% to make 120 K a year, which is $10,000 a month, we needed about a million dollars invested in cash flowing assets. And so I set the base base one as that million dollars in play. Uh, when we sold our little ranch in Texas, we had um, just under half of that um, between our retirement fund, our emergency fund, um, the equity that we got out of that house. It was both cash we put in and equity that we forced from renovations and also just living in it for a couple of years. So we took and piled all of that together and went out and started our business. And I, like I said, I had about half of that million that I needed from, from those um, savings and, and activities. And I knew that I could double that by the year, by the rule of 72 at 10% a year would take 7.2 years to double that. And to me, 7.2 years was too long. My husband was starting this brand new job. We didn't know if he was going to like it. We didn't know if he was going to like the company. And 7.2 years seemed like an an eternity to me. Plus I had no job. And so I thought I would be a good candidate to be an active investor because I want to shorten this timeline down to three, four, five years, not 7.2 to double that. And I need something to do. I mean, when we first moved to Utah, I was literally watching cat videos on YouTube. I was so bored. And so I spent a couple of months just figuring out what I wanted to do. I mean, my house was spotless. My kids were, just, it was, it was just ridiculous. I thought my kids just don't need me at the, the level that they needed me when they were younger. And so I went out and basically started an, a real estate business for all of those reasons. It, it, I like doing one thing that checks a lot of boxes. And for me, that checked a ton of boxes. I love that. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for breaking down the four and 8% rule that, um, you know, because even if you're at eight percent and you're you're checking off at ten percent, theoretically it's growing still every year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're never never touching principal. How have you? Because a lot of deals, especially right now, finding something that throws off ten percent cash on cash is kind of challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of this stuff is baked in IRR with a six percent, you know, cash on cash return. Are you just being hyper selective, or what? How are you finding the opportunities that meet your criteria? <laughs> It's been really difficult because to find something that throws off the yield that you need um, to have a high cash on cash return like that is, it's really challenging with cap rates compressing and you're seeing total returns go down and you're definitely seeing cash on cash return go down. It used to be 10% was the minimum that people needed to, to do a deal at all. And now if you can find 10%, you're doing well. And I'm not talking about 10% from like things that you're doing yourself. Like you can get that off of uh, Airbnbs. You can get that off of a lot of things. But if you're going in as a passive investor where you're just investing for cash flow, um, it's a difficult thing to find in commercial real estate right now. So I think the advantage of putting money into a deal and not as much time, like I still like putting my time into multifamily because that's my niche and that's what I know. And that's what I like to do, what I understand. But being able to diversify your cash into other things that you maybe don't understand as well, because you don't have to run it. I'm never saying that you should invest in something that you don't understand, but you don't have to understand it to the deep level that you would if you were actively managing that actual deal or that portfolio. So looking into assets outside of real estate and talking to other real estate investors, because they're not 100% real estate maxis, we have to be in other things. It would be just like we tell all the crypto people, don't go 100% into crypto. You shouldn't be 100% in real estate either. And so being able to diversify into things that really specialize in high cash flow, like ATM funds, oil and gas, those are the, the notorious ones for high cash flow. There's no upside, but you do enjoy some depreciation. I do like the upside you get off of, of commercial real estate. So I think a 70 to 80% of your portfolio in an asset class that you really understand well, and then you've got some percentage in some some diversified things for hedge also, but just because it does something different in this case, high cash flow. Um, And then you have a little bit left over for some more speculative investments like tech startups, crypto, things like that. So just being well diversified, um, sticking to your lane and letting other people do what they do best, but trusting them with some of your money so that your money can be working for you as well as you're working for yourself. 
Absolutely. That's, uh, that's brilliant. I couldn't have said that better if I had tried. So that's, um, yeah, that's a love, love your, love your mindset behind that. With the last few minutes we have here, I want to talk about your investing club and your group mentorship. How did you build a following around that in order to get that launched? Um, it was actually the plan B. Uh, plan A was to build a network of limited partners who would want to passively invest in deals. And I thought, oh, I want to be a limited partner. I know how to speak to limited partners. But really, the only people I was speaking to and reaching who were reaching out to me were other entrepreneurs. Like, how can I do a deal with you? How can I co GP? I've got $100,000. I've got $200,000. How do I do a co GP? And at $200,000, it's, it's really just difficult to get a large multifamily or large commercial operator to even talk to you about co GP. You need to start bringing three, four, five hundred thousand before you can even have that conversation, especially if you don't have any experience. Right. Uh, I'm a little bit, bit different position because I have some experience and I can help out on a GP in various ways, um, but it just was not going anywhere. And I felt like, where are all my LPs? I went to go do a raise for a large deal and I raised almost nothing. It was just a almost a complete and utter failure. Um, and I just realized I do better raising money for joint ventures. But as the deals got bigger, the joint venture partners have to have more and more cash. And I just, I didn't know anybody or not enough people in the 500 to a million dollar space to put in one single deal. I knew people with 200 who needed to diversify that $50,000 at a time, because that was the only 200,000 they had. And so as I was, as that deal kind of went down the tubes, we weren't able to get the money raised for it. Um, I had a partner on another deal, joint venture, you know, who was a securities attorney um, and had a lot of experience in the private equity fund space for real estate syndications. And he suggested the investment club model, which is basically you pool capital with up to 99 other investors, uh, including yourself makes 100. And as long as you stay under that and follow certain rules, it's not an SEC. It, you're not basically dealing with the SEC because you're not dealing in securities. We buy securities, but we're not offering them. We're not giving any financial advice. I don't charge any fees to join the club. If I did, I, then that puts me in a registered investment advisor territory. And so I don't charge any fees. We meet weekly for free. We look at deals. We decide, do we want to pull our capital into this deal? And we do negotiate our way into the GP to protect that investment, namely, um, but also because a lot of us in the club do have experience and can offer valid and legitimate skills into a general partnership. That is really, really interesting. So you're going to rely on the operator then to, to go find the deal and they bring it to mm -hmm. you. They bring it to yes. your club. And yes. then you as a club, are you guys going in as a fund of funds plus getting a cut of the GP or are you going in just strictly as a GP member and bringing all the capital? Um, well, we go in as individual limited partners. We cannot create um, an investing company for the purpose of investing in securities. That's illegal. Um, it's also a way that people would try to do. That's like the clever idea they get. Well, if I was in your company, even though I'm not accredited, I could still invest in 506C deals. Absolutely not. You still need to be accredited. If it's an accredited entity, every person in the entity must be accredited or the entity has to have $5 million worth of value. And we're never going to do that because we create a new entity for every deal that we go into. So you have, you're basically dealing with all of us individually as limited partners. We all sign the PPM. We all make our own decisions. That's one of the rules. Um, and then we create an entity that then negotiated into the GP, again, to protect that investment, keep an eye on it, and also to be able to contribute our skills as necessary. I would say it's non-managing member, typically more of a board position. Got it. That's uh, that's awesome. I love that. How? What is? What has been the? I know you said you built it really from out of necessity because you were trying to yeah. raise money from limited partners and found that you all your limited partners wanted to be general partners, not limited partners. Yep. So you built that out of necessity. What has been uh, in in my small minds? I don't understand this model that well. It would you know, most of these people wouldn't need a group mentorship, weekly meeting, talking about, you know, the mechanics of deals, but it sounds like that's still an information gap you're able to fill. Yeah, definitely. I think that it, because it's free, there's a lot of, there's a lot of value there. And we have fund managers, we have experienced operators, we have people who've been in the space for several years learning and taking courses, um, but maybe they've never done a deal. So they're looking for their first deal. They definitely want to build a syndication business um, or some sort of capital raising fund. Um, but then we have people in there as well who just want to get into this, but they don't want to build a big business. It's just not something, it's like me, it's just not something that's in our long-term plan. And right. so people can get into the club and really turn it into exactly what they need. If it's just a 
education, if it's just networking, if it's deals, it doesn't really matter. I, again, it's one of those things that I had a lot of different little problems that I was trying to solve. And this one thing checked all of those boxes. I love it. Absolutely love it. Emma, thank you for taking the time to come on today and really break down your business, your kind of story and how uh, how you've re achieved retirement really, um, you know, in just a few short years. So I think that's absolutely awesome and love the uh, love the investing club model as Thank well. You. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Um, my website actually here, let me see, this is my new background, www.highrise.group. And if you go to slash contact, I have links to all my socials there. I have my phone number, my email. You can also uh, book a time in my calendar to talk, whether you want to be a limited partner or a co-GP club member, uh, we can kind of put you in whichever bucket more appeals to you. I definitely still am raising money from limited partner capital. I always, always, always will be doing that. Um, and then if you go to highrise.group slash podcast, it has um, all my interviews that I link there if you want to go through and has tons of, you'll hear the backstory like, a hundred times. But anyway, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, and then you can choose the platform that works best for you, texting, social platforms, whatever, because it's all listed there on that contact page. Fabulous. Emma, thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. This is great.